thank you for coming out to Vanny Studios to join us tonight for a dance talk on Russell Maliphant. I'm Melissa, I'm part of the education program here at The Choice. And we are happy to have Ms. Mara Keith back with us to provide some insight on Russell Maliphant and his work and what we'll be seeing at The Joyce in a couple of weeks. If you're not familiar with Mara, she is a dance scholar and an educator and writer um, in varying capacities um, all over the country, so we're really thrilled to have her with us. Thank Thanks. You. So I'm mostly going to stand and feel free to um, you have a question or a comment that you want to say while we're while I'm talking or looking at stuff, please do. Um, and I think certainly on this side, you'll get more snaps. You guys might be trapped. Um, so here's the, the outline of what I'm gonna talk about tonight. I'm gonna talk about uh, British dance, sort of generally some dancers, and mentioning some dancers and choreographers along the way. Uh, Russell Maliphant's particular path into uh, what we're gonna see in two weeks at the Joyce. Uh, the movement worlds he draws from in his work and his interest in collaborating with a variety of different kinds of artists. And then we'll look at some examples of his work. Uh, some um, older examples that sort of led him to making the uh, work we're going to see in two weeks um, interspersed. Uh, first, I just want to start with an incredibly abbreviated review of two strands of uh, British concert dance history um, that I would argue um, really contribute to what we're going to see at the Joyce. Um, first, the starting with the Royal Ballet uh, School and the Royal Ballet. The school's aim is to train and educate outstanding classical ballet dancers with the particular goal of staffing the um, Royal Ballet, which is uh, based at the Royal Opera House in Women's uh, Covent Garden, and the Birmingham Royal Ballet. And the admission to the school is based purely on talent and potential. And that's where Malapan studied. It's, uh, the Royal Ballet is considered uh, Great Britain's most prestigious ballet company with an enormous rank of um, several you know, core members up to principal dancers and a diverse repertory ranging from the great classical choreographers like founding uh, choreographer uh, Frederick Ashton and principal choreographer Kenneth Macmillan and uh, newer voices um, who are contributing to both continuing the the, the charter that was established in uh, uh, 1956 and continuing uh, today. Um, that's the one hand, this royal ballet tradition. And then there's uh, Britain's uh, contemporary dance roots, which are often referred to as uh, new dance in uh, the UK. And I'm wondering how to define new dance, because new dance seems to be sort of old now in a certain way. But a British choreographer and dance iconoclast, uh, Fergus Early, who was involved in new dance since its inception in the late 1960s and early 1970s, so really when postmodern dance is uh, taking root here in the United States, he announced a kind of manifesto to help define what British new dance was. He said, new dance is not, and here's his list, baggy trousers, rolling about, Chinese shoes, contact improvisation, ballet to rock music, release work, image work, outside performances, postmodern dance, martial arts, self-indulgence, stillness, anything American, and non-narrative. So that was his list of what new dance in the UK was not. But he went on to say that it does not exclude these things. Formal choreography, tap, ballet class, baggy trousers, rolling about, Chinese shoes, jazz shoes, no shoes, army boots, self-indulgence, contract improvisation, rock music, and then virtuosity, stillness, and narrative. So you get the idea that this is something that maybe is undefinable, maybe it's contradictory, uh, but there was a, a surging interest in dance that fell outside the formal parameters of the Royal Ballet and other kinds of institutions that really um, we think of as being part and parcel of the concert dance scene in the UK at that time in the uh, 1970s and early 80s. So these two disparate images of dance come together, I think, in the uh, works over the course of Russell Malafon's career. He was born in Canada and trained at the Royal Ballet School and danced with the Birmingham Royal Ballet, which was formerly known as uh, Sadler Wells Royal Ballet. And then he left to pursue a career in independent dance. He worked with many of the first generation of um, choreographers in the new dance scene, like DV8 Physical Theater, I'll say something more about them in a moment, Michael Clark and Company, Rosemary Butcher. And his career really has tracked this path, leaving the ballet world, going into dance theater, into capoeira and improvisation, into contemporary dance, to hip hop, and back to ballet again. 
So when he was considering himself and everybody else was considering him primarily a ballet dancer, the British choreographer Lloyd Newsom invited him to join the dance theater company called DB8. Uh, DB8 was working on a piece called Dead Dreams for Monochrome Man, and it was a real departure uh, for Malifant, uh, not just in the subject matter, uh, looking at the life of this uh, British serial killer, but also in the style of dancing and the process of making the work. Um, he said in an interview at the time um, when working, uh, working on uh, this piece, he was interviewed by Judith Mackerel for the Guardian newspaper in, in the UK. And uh, he remarked in that interview that he'd never seen dancing like DDA was doing. Um, he thought it was uh, kind of brutal and violent uh, and very different from what he was uh, experiencing in ballet and realized he could stay in the ballet world and keep working on the kind of perfection uh, that how do you get it right, how do you get it right, because there's always a right and wrong he in his perception of ballet. But then being introduced to dance theater through GB8, he realized there was a whole world of dance that he knew nothing about. And, and that that was really energizing for him, that it wasn't about being correct or perfect or incorrect, but uh, about how can you generate movement that I think really um, that kind of ambition and curiosity uh, really started his um, hints at his, you know, or foreshadows his future ambitions, I think, as a dance maker, and as somebody who's interested in all different kinds of movement. Another course of exploration after working with DB8 was with uh, British uh, choreographer Laurie Booth. Um, Booth is a leading figure in postmodern dance in the UK, sort of related uh, to uh, new dance. And he, what, what um, Malifant really got from working with Booth in particular was that Booth is an expert improviser. And what uh, Malifant terms um, instant choreography, if you think about the notion of improvisation when done by really talented improvisers, it's all of those practices and decisions that are made in choreography, but in, the, in, in a much more uh, shortened amount of time, you have to make those decisions quickly and in response to things around you. Uh, and so that, that kind of freedom, so different from a ballet world where you'd be being taught repertory, et cetera, um, that made for Malifant, uh, gave him a kind of boldness, and it, it allowed him to have courage to go into dance making. So to go back to British, uh, writer Fergus Early and his list of things that new dance could and could not be about. This is what Malifant is freely borrowing from both the lists. So from the list of things to be excluded, improvisation, rolling about, and martial arts. I'm going to say more about martial arts in a moment. And then the maybe could be included in choreography would be formal choreography, ballet class, virtuosity, and stillness. So this, I think, is an interesting kind of uh, shift from a lot of postmodern dance that was happening simultaneously in the United States where really there was a, a resistance to that sense of virtuosity and the, and the ballet training. Um, but this was much more welcomed in a kind of crossover way um, for, for people working at that, that time in the UK when, when the elephant is first starting to make his, his work. So what I find particularly striking is his absolute curiosity about different kinds of movement styles. And, and the seemingly endless notion of what kinds of movement are part of the concert dance world. And you're going to see that in the Joyce in two weeks. Um, not just the stylistic and uh, technical movement idioms you maybe think of coming from ballet and modern dance or contemporary dance, depending on your terminology, but also a real dedication to vernacular forms of dance as well, but uh, shaped to be in the concert dance uh, setting. Working with Laurie Booth, whom I mentioned earlier, Malifant also discovered the, uh, the dance and martial art form of capoeira um, and, and how to bring this, uh, this, this thing that comes out of a, a, a movement practice from Brazil that's been stylized and used by lots of different people into contemporary work, looking at the sense of um, leverage and momentum, a sense of groundedness with um, really virtuosic kinds of spins and balances and um, upside down or inverted um, maneuvers. That kind of openness to understanding that it wasn't all about the vertical of ballet, but could be upside down or uh, constantly in motion uh, brought him to other kinds of dance forms, not, not for him so much as a mover, but also as a, a viewer and looking at uh, hip hop and particularly popping, which we'll see um, an example of in a moment. The company, the Los Malifant Company, was established in 1996. He'd been working as an independent choreographer, making works for uh, different small uh, groups of dancers, and he decided he really wanted the framework 
to initiate productions and to work with his own ensemble of dancers that he would bring together and really uh, do kind of deeper investigations. In the almost 20 years since that founding, he's received quite a bit of popular and critical acclaim, especially in the UK. Uh, he's received uh, Critics Circle National Dance Awards for the best modern choreography, so interestingly uh, being categorized at least by the Critics Circle as a modern choreographer, as well as a, Sa a South Bank Show Award and Olivier Award, among other things. And he's been an artistic associate at Sadler's Wells Theater since 2005. I want to now start to look at some of the dancing, and along the way I'm going to talk about Malifant and some of his collaborators, and as I said, I've mixed in some older repertory um, to kind of set up uh, what we're going to see um, in two weeks. So first we're going to look at uh, three brief excerpts, and I'll stop them in between so we can talk about them, um, from Broken Fall. Uh, this work was danced, uh, is danced, and what we're going to see, by British uh, ballet dancers and ballet boys company founders, uh, Michael Nunn and William Trevitt and the French ballet at Sylvie Pien. In an interview at Jacob's Pillow, uh, William Trevor explained that he had seen Malifant's piece called Critical Mass, which we'll also see in a moment. And Trevitt and Nunn called Malifant and asked him to make work for them. And he said to them, uh, no thanks, you're ballet dancers. I'm not interested in that now. This was in uh, the uh, late 90s. So they got a videotape of the piece Critical uh, Mass and just studied it and learned it by watching it on television and then invited Malifant to come to the studio and see them perform it. And it was their performance of this work that he had made for uh, very different kinds of dancers um, in the studio setting that led him to think, all right, you're doing a good enough job. And he uh, went and made a duet for them, but also uh, has made, he's made several works uh, for them over the years. This piece, uh, Broken Folly, created um, with Sylvie Guillaume and the, ba uh, Guillaume and, uh, the Ballet Boys together. And it's, it's um, a striking piece. Uh, Guillaume is the French ballerina who is uh, an amazing, um, she's an, an omnivore of dance. We think of her maybe as being in the ballet world, but you'll see in this work that she um, is pushing herself to do very different kinds of things. So let's look at the first excerpt and then we will talk about it. Stillness, just like we were told we could have. Thank you. 
should have uh, said that it's a sort of torture to see clips of things, um, which is, I think, part of the plan. So you'll go and see things live, we'll, which will also be a, a more high, higher quality than a video can ever be to see it live. Uh, but the reason I wanted to start with this clip is that I think one of the things that I find striking about Malatant's work is uh, you have to more than meet it halfway. It doesn't pop off the stage and invite you in, and it's not, it's not, um, its goal isn't to sort of be entertaining and um, in, in that kind of way that feels like you can just sit back and consume it, that you, you have to sort of settle in and look at it um, and, and let the work wash over you and, uh, and dig in. So you see the two figures of the Valley Boys that um, uh, are the, there, and they're quite remote from each other. And you'll notice that quite uh, uh, throughout all of the clips we'll look at how the lighting design really works to sculpt the space, and I'll say more about that in a moment. So you've got these two different worlds that are set up that are maybe, maybe parallel, maybe they're a reflection of one another, and the movement is kind of, um, it's unhurried. It's, uh, it's got a kind of a, a matter of fact quality about it. And that we really get to see, this is, a, this is a few minutes into the piece, and we really get to see this world sort of starting to um, rotate uh, in, in a kind of spare or austere quality. And then in comes DM, and the lighting shifts dramatically with that, going from that uh, cool light to the warm light as she enters, and the worlds then change. And this, I think, is a theme that you'll see in some of the um, later works as well, that, that by bringing different movement ideas together or different movement sensibilities in the movers themselves together can really be uh, highlighted um, with uh, the light. So uh, for, for Malachan, the collaborators here are cer is certainly the lighting designer, but it's also these dancers and, and what, they're, um, what they're willing to do. And we'll see that in the next clip. So let's look at uh, the second clip from Broken Fall. So uh, what I find intriguing about this trio is that I think we can see him drawing on his understanding of the duet form from ballet, but then it's not that at all. So that you see, you, it could, you could imagine them being in the studio and thinking, well, here's the woman, here's the man, and what are the expectations we have of that, especially with uh, Sylvie Guillaume in there with all of her experience being partnered in the ballet world, and now what can we do to uh, upend those expectations? So is it that three people are essential to the counterbalance in some of those moments? Or is it that all of a sudden she's not being partnered, but it's the shadow of the two men moving together? So it keeps the relationships among the three of them uh, keep shifting, even in that, you know, it's about a minute clip we just looked at, and we saw all the different kinds of um, investigations that, that, that Malachan was doing in the studio with these answers to be able to build this kind of both uh, precision the puzzle making and how it all fits together and then uh, doesn't fit together. Um, but still with the same kind of studied quality about it, get a little hint of counterbalance in there. And now let's look at this third clip. Mm -hmm. 
beautifully, but it's not, it's very much about um, hands on waist or leg versus uh, unexpected kinds of sides of the body touching other sides of the body. So what I think you see in this is that, that Malachan took that understanding of, of how you can experiment with what's possible and, and push expectations of what those ballet trained bodies would uh, be able to do. Uh, so I think that's about how the partnering comes about. Another thing I really find striking about this is that it doesn't telegraph what's going to happen next. So you don't necessarily see the kind of preparation to know exactly what direction she's going to fly, who's going to catch her, or is it even going to be um, about him and her or the other hand, or is it maybe going to be about the two men? So um, I, I find that kind of investigation interesting as well. Tell us about the risk that somehow he does something in the studio, granted these are extraordinary dancers, but he does something in the studio to get them to keep pushing what they're comfortable doing. How, how far will she fall? How close to the ground will she be? Um, the other thing about these two clips that you, or the three clips that you heard is we, oh, this is the course, this is a piece that's about 30 minutes long, and, and it really takes us on different kinds of musical journeys. So it's, he's not using a musical score to structure his choreography. It starts in kind of austere electronic score. Then we hear a more romantic kind of piano uh, come in as she's introduced. And here we're back into the uh, electronic, but a little more driving sense to it, which is also building the tension of um, what's going on between them. Um, so he's working very closely um, with composers to, to create the kinds of atmospheres that um, happen in these dances. So the um, lighting designer for th these works, he's worked with for more than 17 years, it's a guy named Michael Hulls. And what, you're, what you see in these works is that the visual content of the works isn't just about the dancing bodies. Um, so much of it is also about watching how the, the, the light can really sculpt the space and, and become kind of an architecture in which these dancers are operating, and it really um, will stand out 
uh, as we continue to look at these. So angles and shadows, planes, textures, negative and positive space, all things that get talked about in uh, choreography also can get talked about in architecture and lighting design and putting them together um, really, uh, I think, calls our attention to what we're seeing in addition to sort of what we're feeling kinesthetically. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at is um, from Still Current, the show that we'll see at the Joyce in uh, two weeks. Um, this is a piece called Traces. And you're going to see a couple of things that are familiar from what we've just looked at. Uh, first is that sense of building tension that we were kind of getting between the second and the third clips. But also notice how uh, each of these dancers is quite precise and deliberate and exact in his movement but also how uh, Malakant really lets them be individuals within that. So he's not trying to recreate a corps de ballet kind of mentality, but really who are, there's a deliberateness to this work, but this is still about these three dancers as uh, individuals. Um, it's not a uniform idea of what the moving body should look like. Uh, so even, even when they're in unison, you'll still see some differences in, I think, nuanced ways. And I think it suggests that uh, it's a kind of community that welcomes the diversity of uh, dancing ideologies as well as um, peoples themselves. So let's look at traces. So the uh, first thing I want to talk about there is um, to point out how the light really, uh, the lighting moves in a way that matches what Malakam is doing choreographically. So each uh, dancer is in his own circle, but they have their also a uniform circles. So that sense of circularity is in the moving body, is in the uh, line that's inscribed 
uh, both by the movement of the, of the planes of the body, but also for the extension with the sticks that they're using. But then it's also inscribed by the light itself. So as the dancers move through the space, the circles also move through the space. And somewhat seamlessly, like you don't really know, oh, they're going there next, but that they arrive and they have a new um, environment that they're in. You see some, uh, some basic post, uh, postmodern kinds of conventions of uh, how to explore things. So you see senses of canon, you see the task and precision-like quality to this movement. You see the counterpoint of it being uh, three individuals, then two against one being done with timing in a very uh, studied kind of way. You can feel how it's starting to build, both in the music and as the, the spirals are increasing and in their um, a unison, uh, building of unison and canon that gives it that kind of um, building feel. Uh, uh, Maliphant is the uh, shaved head uh, white guy in that section and he will be performing um, at the Joyce. Now for something completely different, and you'll see how Malafam uh, brings those two dancers that we saw in that are also in works that are at the Joyce, and they have really different movement backgrounds. And we're going to see uh, excerpts of them uh, doing solo work. But first, I, I want to say something about um, maybe uh, Dixon, who is African, uh, Afri I can't say African American because he's not. I'm going to say the black man because he's from the UK. Um, he started dancing, uh, doing street forms. His main styles were popping and um, boogaloo and had done lots of kind of competition dancing and those street forms turned competition forms and then got interested in like how could dance function not just in the vernacular settings, not just in the competition settings, but in the concert dance world and so started to study at the London Contemporary Dance School. And uh, Malfant saw uh, Dixon, who had already started to have his interest in the concert dance world, um, and when he was studying at, at Sadler's Wells, but he had first seen him at a breaking convention in, in 2011, and he wanted him to join uh, the Rodin Project, which we'll talk about in a moment. And, and even though his background was very different from this coming up to the Royal Ballet School, there was something about his um, gorgeous moving that Malatant wanted to work with. So the first thing we're gonna see is um, me uh, popping, and it's uh, just a YouTube clip of him in his earlier, uh, Oh. Ready if you are. Oh, I skipped. That's why you're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did skip. Well, so the torsion is the one that you want to go to torsion, or you want to go to popping. I want to go to popping, and then I'm going to go back to torsion. And hopefully, I'll be able to. Can you do that? Torsion. Pay no attention Let's to the behind see. the scenes. <laughs> Styles quiz popping. What do you think? No. no. So sorry. I'm gonna. I'll talk about this one since I've got them out of. I got. I have them out of sequence. We'll go with that one. Let me just say something about it, and then we'll go to the uh, to the popping that I already talked about. So this piece torsion um, is another collaboration between Malafant and the Ballet Boys, and and the reason I had this next in my mind when I was setting it up was because. His long collaboration with lighting designer has made uh, Malfan very interested in what other kinds of visual elements can you bring into the work. So both as the subject matter, Rodin Project, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, but also what happens if you bring other kinds of visual elements into that. So this is a piece that was made for stage, and what we're going to see in this is how he's, he's worked um, with video artists in making it for film. To, um, to play with the, uh, the visual elements coming from the lighting and the moving bodies, um, and uh, then fed through various kinds of video um, tricks. So, torsion. Thank you, sorry for the confusion.
Thanks. I'm just going to say something about that before we go to the pop thing I just talked about. Um, although you can see that it's clearly been, you know, the, the video is being manipulated, it's doing the same kinds of things as the choreography uh, so that, that we um, have a feeling of circling that's already built into the choreography. So you sort of have a sense of like, well, if I were in the studio, I could be walking around and seeing this dance from multiple angles. You get the sense of seeing it from one performer or the other performer's perspective. You get this, the sense of the layering, which is what happens with the canon in the earlier clips. So that's the way that when the, you still see the shadow of something and then the next thing happens. So it, it sort of builds a sense of um, momentum in it. But the other thing is you get to really see the close-ups and look at how the partnering works. And this is where I feel like uh, his sense of uh, geometry and investigation is so clear. And how, how can I lift what would happen if you two are about the same size, so if you lean this way, what happens? And how can it be um, very controlled and not about this kind of uh, force and momentum we think of in, in kind of catching and throwing from contact improvisation, but the same sort of um, same sort of systems in operation, but with much more um, deliberation on the part of uh, the performers. And the electronic score heightens the sense of the electronic kind of uh, feedback interference that gets layered in there also. Okay. Now we'll go to popping, which good job that everybody knew that wasn't what popping looks like in seeing that. way that that's different, lots of ways, right? It's with the music. It um, has a sense of uh, ongoingness. It's got multiple points of um, uh, movement focus in the body simultaneously. It's got a sense of syncopation. It's got a kind of lightness in the performance. All of those ways you could see that uh, Mal found with his ballet training and his investigation of things like uh, we've seen him doing would see nothing in there that would be more than kind of a fascinating way of moving. The things that are similar about it is the attention to detail, uh, the very particular way that uh, Mobi is um, inscribing the space, uh, the um, deliberate quality, although it has a kind of a, a more of a sense of freedom about the movement, it has that same uh, kind of, uh, of it's, um, it's not an explosive, it's a contained uh, investigation uh, physically. So when they started working together, um, they worked together first on the Rodin project, which was uh, at the Joyce, I think, two years ago. And uh, it was something that, that, that was a very different kind of um, 
investigation for certainly for Muvi in his background of working mostly with music driving the sensibility and now working with Molotov. And what we're going to see in this next clip, and we'll see at the Joyce Live, um, is, is how these two worlds have come together. The uh, thing about uh, this clip is all of the kinds of uh, popping motifs are also echoed in the lighting. So in a certain way, it makes it a little bit hard to watch on video as, as high quality as the video of this is. But it's because the, the movement and the um, lighting design are, again, uh, so collaboratively working. Uh, so Malafant working with his collaborator in lighting, but also his collaborator in the dancing. And this is a piece called Still. this um, at the Joyce, you'll see sort of right before uh, where we came in there, you see much more of the kind of um, world that he has created, he has created with his popping sensibility that then gets interrupted by the entrance of um, the woman, very similar to the way that uh, in the, the opening clip we looked at in Broken Fall when uh, Sylvie Guillaume walks into the space that it changes the world. So similar kind of thing. A light, a, a light shift, a new person enters, those worlds then get uh, melded a little bit. So uh, the relationship between the two of them uh, changes 
after uh, as they start to move much more together. Um, this this is uh, the the last uh, old thing we'll look at is uh, critical mass. This is um, the dance that the ballet boys uh, learned off video to prove that they were worthy of uh, commissioning a dance from Maliphant. Um, and it's I think it's a, a the two things I like about it is this is um, Maliphant dancing it. Um, it's also uh, we see again him thinking about the the role that a camera can play. Um, but what you also will see in this. Uh, is I think what so much of still current the show that uh, we'll see next week uh, is, a, is considering is like what can you do with small groups of people because it's a solo or a, a, a duet or a trio and this so this duet is really I think uh, an exploration of a relationship um, and, the, and the, the kind of negotiation that happens so we'll just look at the um, the opening few minutes of it and I think you'll see both elements of contact improvisation and capoeira in the partnering. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about it. with a f the final dance clip and then take questions or comments about any of this. Um, because I think one of the things that is striking to me about his work is how he keeps being curious about new elements. So we'll just look at about a minute of this. The Rodin Project, he explains what it is and the, the piece after light that he uh, refers to as coming uh, before in time, we will see both a clip of and uh, next week. So let's look at about a minute of that interview. I've known Rodin's work for 30 years. I became familiar with it when I was a student, and it's always been inspiring. You know, the shapes, the texture, the um, physicality, you know, as a dance, um, as a choreographer who's interested in sculpture anyway, you know, that's always been an inspiration. So, um, in the last project, after doing something that was kind of based around Nijinsky and drawings of Nijinsky, we really enjoyed the process, having 
as something to pin information on. There's already so many fantastic watercolors and sculptures and ideas with, with the body and configurations and forms. It just seemed like that would be a great place to go from. Well, I work almost all the time with Michael Holes, the lighting designer Michael Holes. We collaborated together, I think, for 17 years or so now. And the collaborators for the rest of the piece, um, I had worked with Es Devlin on um, a piece called Small Boats and Afterlight. I wanted to have the opportunity to work with her again, and she does sets. So we decided for the structure of the piece quite early on, as Michael and I were talking, we try and split it into two halves for thinking about it. And we, we had various ideas, and you know, we, we started with kind of marble and bronze, and we thought, kind of that's not working as the differentiation. Um, so I, I, I had some books on Rodin's watercolors, and, and there were so many that were fantastic that I thought, well, let's go into watercolor and sculpture as a, as a reference and a way to gather information. For the sculpture part, we wanted something like plinths. So what I, what I um, really like about uh, hearing him talk is to get a sense of what his research is like. You certainly see the effects of his research and how he collaborates with the dancers, but here he's, he's layering in something else. So it's not that this work is particularly narrative any more than the other works are narrative except suggestive of relationships but that there, he's getting inspiration from something that he's always been exploring with a lighting designer to add, not just sculpture in the body, but maybe sculpture of, of sources in the body. So the piece that he uh, was talking about that came before this was Afterlight. Um, it was uh, inspired by uh, uh, Nijinsky's uh, photographs of him and drawings Nijinsky uh, made uh, sort of near the end of his life. And uh, it was created for Sadler's Wells when they were doing something that, it, it was a celebration of all things in the spirit of Diaghilev, and it has uh, become really a signature work of Maliphant's. Um, and uh, the Daily Telegraph said about the relationship uh, between Maliphant and the lighting designer Holes in this, that this was uh, the most important creative partnership in uh, modern British dance. So you'll also see projection um, that is coming from from above that creates a really beautiful atmosphere for the dancer to perform in. So it's similar to the sort of post-intervention done by video in the earlier clips we were, uh, looked at. Here, uh, Malifant figured out how to do it uh, in live performance as well.
So I love this solo. I think that um, I think in, in some ways it sort of summarizes Malafant's career up until that point. You can see those beautiful tours coming from the from the ballet training. You can see that kind of liquid sensibility and ease of moving in and out of the ground coming from his experience both with capoeira and contact improvisation. You can see uh, a little sense of maybe a street dancer in that performer as well, and how all of those things um, make total sense when combined in this world. You also can see how uh, Malfant and Holt have worked to use the video uh, as both the way to create the environment that the dancer is moving in becomes a moving part as well, and it, and it uh, functions as a light source, so that that all of these things that he's been exploring over the years um, are coming together in this piece. Um, the sati music is very different from the uh, electronic scores that we've mostly heard, uh, certainly an echo to the inspiration of, work, of um, working to think about Diaghilev, and, or sorry, not Diaghilev, um, Nijinsky, and I think, um, there's something that feels both vintage and totally um, up to date and modern of the, the, the way the uh, dancer carries himself. So I think um, what we're gonna see um, on the 10th to the 14th of December, uh, in, in Still Current, we're gonna see solos and duets and trios, and you're gonna see that kind of um, fierce physicality, but done with a kind of matter of fact quality. So it's not about, uh, exhibition and showing off, but inviting us in to um, the worlds that they create, the collaborators of choreographer, dancer, and designer. Um, questions or comments or observations about the things we've seen or anything I've said? Happy to. I'm also happy to have us all have some cheese and talk about it. I just really love the last part and it seems like it's a totally new idea to make the video like the light is coming in and it looked like he was going to be sucked in into something. I was like, wow. <laughs> and it's something right that it's, it's already set, you already have set up, it's set up one way and yeah, then all of a sudden the world is shrinking. Yeah. Um, like expect it to get smaller and then um, like it's still full and, and you don't even notice but then you realize and it's like, wow. Right, so very similar to we, as we were seeing in the lighting shifting in the, the solo or the trio with the three men in the circles with yeah. the with the sticks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 